I don't know what your New Year's resolution is, but if it's to save money, the Acorns app is the way to go. You might be one of those people at the end of the year, you don't have any money set aside for your family, for your friends, or for your kids when it comes to the Christmas holidays. Well, the Acorns app is a great way to save money and you don't even know you're doing it. Say you make a transaction for $4.80, they're gonna round it up, take that 20 cents, put it in another account, and they're gonna do that with you all year. Every time you're making transactions or halfway through January, and I've already put $50 aside and I didn't even know I did it. So check out Acorns. It's in the description of this video. Just click my link. They're going to put $5 in the account for you. And if you're listening on a streaming platform, it's going to be in the show notes. Let's get to the B-Side podcast. One, two, one, two. You know how we do with your boy BQ. Welcome to another episode of the B-Side podcast covering Impact Wrestling. If you're listening on the Impact Lounge YouTube channel, thank you so much. If it's your first time, please hit that subscribe button. This is the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. And if you're listening on streaming media on a streaming platform, thank you so much for being here. So let's get into the topics at hand really quick because I want to get to the hard to kill review. And there's been a lot of news, a lot of drama going on with Impact right now. So Let's get into it. Let's talk about these news topics first, and then we're going to get into Hard to Kill, the Hard to Kill pay-per-view. So, first thing up, now this is this was yesterday, this news came out yesterday, that Twitch has basically canceled Impact, so they banned them from the platform due to the explicit segment with RVD, Katie Forbes, and I uh, forgot the other lady's name, but uh, Katie Forbes' girlfriend. So... I actually had not seen that episode of Impact yet. Whenever they put out, whenever I know it's going to be some kind of special or some kind of like that, I usually, honestly, a lot of times I don't even get around to watching it at all. The December episodes where they're doing the awards and all that, I didn't watch either of those episodes, the the best of. I don't I don't care about those. That's just me personally. I, I just don't. Um, so this one I haven't seen yet. Because I know it wasn't really a new episode yet. I'm going to get around to it. I'm most likely going to watch it tonight. So I saw a little bit of the clip. I haven't seen the whole thing. Again, I'm going to watch it tonight. And I will, you know, judge better from there. But, you know, obviously there was a segment that didn't jive with Twitch's terms of service. And as of now, they look like it looks like Impact's being banned from the channel. Or from the platform, I should say. So maybe this is something they're going to work out. You know, but it's odd because Ace Austin had the segments too, where he was like filming the the porn or whatever. So, you know, it's not to say that impact hasn't done this kind of stuff before, you know, they've, they've been doing adult content, but obviously something with this, you know, this, uh, this, this pushed it though, from what I saw and what I've been reading, this obviously has pushed it well, well beyond the Ace Austin stuff. So I saw some Twitter chatter last night where people are saying, well, you know, maybe they should just broadcast on YouTube instead and most people don't really understand how the ad revenue works between YouTube, Twitch, all that. So Impact, from what I understand, I don't know what their contract is with Twitch. But from my knowledge, because there's a couple ways people get paid on Twitch. You know, some do it through, most people do it through advertising, Twitch advertising, um, or Twitch ads, when ads are played on Twitch, I should say. And then obviously you can get donations and you know, subscribers that people, you know, they pay into the subscription service and all that. So, you know, there's obviously that. Now, Impact does have that. And what's going to hurt them right now is because if they are off Twitch, they're going to lose that monthly subscriber income that they've been receiving. And even if they're back on Twitch next week, that's not to say half of these people didn't unsubscribe yesterday or cancel that subscription. But from what I understand, a company like Impact... They they have a completely different contract with Twitch, and the way they usually work is, let's just say, they're broadcasting uh, one of the Twitch specials specials for the month. For every person who watches an hour of that, they receive a dollar. Now this this is like don't quote me on this stuff because I don't know what Impact's deal is with them. I just know 
the way the larger companies and corporations, how some of their contracts work with Twitch, it's much different than someone who just streams on Twitch, you know, has a gaming channel or something like that. But from what I understand, I think it's anywhere from 10 cents to a dollar. So there, there is some kind of room there. But I would imagine it's closer to a dollar. So if someone watches an hour of the Twitch special, they get a dollar. So on paper, that's really a lot more lucrative. But as we've seen, you know, the Twitch specials went from, you know, 3,000 people watching to sometimes there's like 400 people. And for me, this Twitch platform has never clicked for Impact. They've tried a few different things. They did the um, behind the lights or whatever it's called. I, I rarely watch that. I catch it sometimes. Uh, but you had, you know, 150 people watching and you've got a big name like Anthony Corelli on there. And then, uh, you know, Alicia Atu was doing that for a while, you know, so, you, you know, you had some good hosts. Iceman's done a good job and the platform is cool. And I commend them for trying to get in early on that, but I just don't think it ever worked that ever clicked because that's not really what Twitch is for. Yeah. Like there's an opportunity to expand on Twitch and to do different things, but it's it's just not what Twitch is for. It is more for gaming and, and things of that nature. So I commend them for what they were trying to do. And as I said, the, the that contract, if you're talking someone watches for an hour, you, you get a dollar. That's on paper very lucrative. If you're talking about trying to do the Twitch specials every month, but the problem is the viewership has constantly gone down. And yeah, they have, you know, 24 seven viewership and it's all the classic shit where, you know, there's maybe 20, 50 people watching throughout the day. You know what I mean? It, I mean, at a time I should say, and so many of us are so done with the classic TNA library. Like so many of us don't care. Now there's some matches. Yeah. We could go back and yeah, let's watch some of this, you know, um, I'll watch that Taryn Terrell, Karen, uh, sorry, Taryn Terrell, Gail Kim match any day of the week, but for the most part, most of us don't really care anymore. You know, I've tried doing gaming with Joe Hendry in the past. Uh, I know Havoc does it now. Uh, there was someone else who had a show on there. I don't quite remember. Maybe Ethan Page was doing something on there. So it's just something that hasn't really translated, hasn't really clicked. Now with YouTube, the ad revenue is a lot less. Uh, I would imagine, I, I don't want to throw a number out there, but... The ad revenue is less, but they get so many more views on YouTube that it's actually it's actually more lucrative for them, and that's why I'm very uh, that's why I get pissed off about their YouTube. I'm very critical of it because you can put anything on there any day of the week, and you're just making money. You know, um, for for a company like that, I should say that has as many subscribers and gets as many views as they do. You know, you, you can put it, put anything on there. So I would like to see them use that energy they're putting into Twitch and just put it on YouTube. Like they're going to get so many more views on there and they are going to make more money for it. And that's why I'm just like, man, put original content on YouTube. Like I, I just don't get it. You're just throwing money down the toilet, not throwing it down the toilet, but you're leaving money on the table because you just want to post highlights and old matches all the time. And it's like, oh my God, there's no way that that. Is working for you so I don't know what's gonna happen with twitch I hope that they just move off the platform and I would even like to see them stop doing the monthly twitch shows to be honest I think they should just focus on the impact plus show and make that as good as it can be this last one that the bash at a brewery too was excellent everything from top to bottom the wrestling the audio the the, the visual uh, the commentary like Please keep D'Lo on there personally. Please get rid of Don Callis forever on commentary. So focus on that. Focus on the Impact Plus shows and that platform. And then if that pops off later, then maybe do a, a YouTube show. Like you see how popular AEW Dark has become. I don't watch AEW Dark. I watch the main show, but I don't really have any interest in Dark because that's now we're just getting to too much wrestling for me to consume. But I don't watch that. Then NWA obviously broadcast their program on their every week, um, you know, impact can do something like that. They, if you take the concept of like explosion, you know, explosion could be on YouTube, but explosion, that brand is dead. I mean, dead, 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 dead. So they really need to rebrand that new name, new ideas, get rid of the classic match. Again, we're, we're relying on the classic matches, but get it rid of all that. And you can launch a YouTube show that's going to do well. It's all in how, 
you market it. Like AEW came with a cool name with AEW Dark and, you know, pretty cool graphics for it. And, and people treated it as like a must-see type of thing, you know, a lot of the time where Impact delivers their secondary stuff as, oh, if you happen to catch it, cool, you know, but ain't shit going to happen on there. You know, so we'll see what happens with Twitch, though. I, I hope that they just kind of go with YouTube going forward uh, so that I can resubscribe to YouTube because I unsubscribe from Impact's YouTube because it gives me no value whatsoever. Uh, Tessa's drama, this is the next thing. I, I don't really want to get into this like a whole lot. I think people have read and heard about this enough. And it's funny because you're talking about the wrestling fans are so weird. They're so weird. You know, if Tessa was in AEW or WWE and, and something like this came forth, people would handle it. They, they would react to it so much differently than her being a part of Impact. We all know that. It's bananas. And it's funny because some of the people coming forward, Chelsea Green, Allison K, they, they were in Impact. So it's like, okay, so now all you weirdo wrestling fans are now you're supporting them. Now you're, you know, care what they have to say because they're no longer with the company. Like it's so, it's so odd like that, but I'm being, I'm being really careful and having too strong of an opinion on this because I want to support Tessa. I want to support impact, but I also, Allison Kay is, you know, formerly known as Sienna. Uh, one of my, I'd say top three or four, uh, acquaintances in wrestling, you know, as, as far as someone I, uh, I know decently well, uh, not saying we're, you know, best friends or anything like that, but you know, as far as, you know, an, an acquaintance, she's up there for me. So I have a certain level of respect for her to where I'm not going to trash her name and all this, you know, but I also want to support impact too. So my, my opinion isn't too strong, but of it, but I will say, I think there is a lot of truth to it. And if you think back when Tessa was I don't think I wouldn't I wouldn't say when she joined the company, but when she was uh, in negotiations or the rumors were that she was in negotiations. You remember Chelsea Green, Laurel Van S. She quit the company pretty abruptly, even though she was the knockouts champion. And then, you know, Sienna also didn't resign. And I knew she was happy with impact. And you have to wonder, like, did that, you know, did that stem from not wanting to work with Tessa because we've heard that there was locker room issues with, with Tessa and enough people are coming forward that remember there's always truth. Truth's always in the middle. Uh, it's very easy to see, read one side of the story, but there's enough people coming forward that common sense says there's, there is truth to this. The whole racist thing. That's I, I don't, I don't buy into that at all. I don't think, uh, any level headed wrestling fan really buys into that. But I'm, I commend Impact for sticking with Tessa because they were faced with a situation. They're at a crossroads. Are we going to put the belt on her or are we going to, you know, massage the pussies of these internet fans and these websites and everything? But I hope that this starts to get brushed under the rug. I have to wonder, though, we use the ter- you know, the term bullying gets thrown, a- thrown around so loosely. Bullying is... You can be a bi- uh, a bitch or you can be a dick, but that doesn't make you a bully. That just makes you a bitch or a dick or, you know, makes you an asshole. But it doesn't make you a bully. Bullying is, you know, constant berating from one person to another on a regular basis. And in, in that case, the, the person doing the berating and during the bullying is usually seen of, usually comes from usually comes from a place of intimidation. You know what I mean? It's it, the bullying person is seen as the, the bigger, stronger, uh, the more, more dominant person in the, in the conversation or in the room or, or, or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So there, there's a level of intimidation there as well. And, and bullying is constant is constant. And I, I usually think bullying, you know, we, we have this term online bullying, internet bullying, social media bullying, whatever, like bullying, there's usually some physicality that comes with that. And we're just kind of throwing that term around, you know, just cause you walk into a rock locker room and maybe you're, uh, uh, you know, being kind of a, being an ass or whatever, that doesn't make you a bully. But I also have to wonder that these women coming forward, like what, what was their intention? Because you're sitting here and saying, you know, 
Tessa's this bad person. She's this bully. She's she talks down to people. She treats people like this. Then why are you saying something? You know, they're they are not displaying, in my opinion, the the they're not taking the higher road. You know what I mean? Like they're actually trying to turn it around on her. Like if anything, that's coming off as bullying because it's you've got women coming out of the woodworks coming, well, this and this, and I got I got this and this to say about it. Like, what is your intention? To hurt her status in the wrestling community? That's no better than what you are complaining she's doing to you. You know, so I really have to wonder what what they think they're doing by coming forward and, and saying all these things. But this all this all guarantees we're going to see uh, Tessa with impact long term because you've had someone from NWA step, you know, step up. You've had someone from NXT. You've had <laughs> two people from AEW. You know, Priscilla Kelly was one of the ones who stepped up. And I'm like, damn, because I really that was really one of the girls that I wanted to see be a knockout. But, you know, I guess that's not happening but, you know, good on the Impact fans who stepped up and supported her and Impact wrestlers, you know, good on good on all that. But again, I have to wonder what was the intention if you're accusing someone, but then you're being that in return. That doesn't make you any better, you know. So let's hope this this all starts kind of to get brushed under the rug. But I, I do think there's there's absolute truth behind it. But it also happened years ago. And I don't want to be, have things held against me. I've made poor decisions in life. I would hate for someone to hold me, hold those against me two years later, three years later, you know. And that's that's why a lot of us get out of relationships because sometimes we make huge mistakes early on, and then you know you maybe with that person a couple of years, and they're just not dropping it. And then at some point, it's like, okay, I know I messed up, but I'm going to move on if you can't drop this, you know. So we have to learn to be forgiving people and that's with with everything whether it's wrestling or just everyday life it's we have to we have to be forgiving people we have to be a forgiving society and i try to explain that with something with michael vick the other day when you know they're trying to ban him from the pro ball pro ball game and i'm like you know i don't support what he did at all but is he still engaging in this behavior like are we going to make this guy feel like a piece of crap for the rest of his life you know I don't know how sorry he is about what he did or anything. I, I don't, but I also believe in being a forgiving society and it's not, you know, it's not saying that what I think he did was right or I can, you know, um, you know, I'm, I have animals, so I love animals. Is this something I can just get over and be like, you know, yeah, those poor dogs, you know, but what has he done since then? And you have to look at that with Tessa too. Like she was 22 years old. Now she's 24. You know, has she transformed herself then since then, it, you know, have, have anyone complained about her in the last two years, year, month, you know? So let's hope we start moving past all that. Brian cage. That's a, that's been a really big topic too about, is he going to AEW? I think, um, Trent and nurse Nicole talked about this quite a bit on the total nonstop impact podcast but um he hasn't signed anything and i know that when melissa came forth and everyone's like oh she's denying it because that's what wrestlers do no he really has not signed anything um i know that with 100 percent certainty uh he's still deciding and i think he's meeting with uh impact this weekend from what i understand so he hasn't even received an offer from them this was, you know, I think the rumor stemmed from someone who actually worked within AEW. And then I think they passed it on to who who knows. And then it went to that SoCal website, whatever, and then to Melter. And I know Melter saying, oh, I believe my contact, you know. So who am I compared to Melter? But I, I think that the information we've received uh, at the Impact Lounge, it, it, it's first-hand, second-hand information. I can tell you that for a fact. And what Meltzer's getting is third, fourth, fifth-hand information. So I know that he hasn't signed anything. And I believe, from what I'm understanding, Melissa's very happy with Impact. And Cage, Cage is happy too because the Impact schedule has allowed them to raise their daughter with no issues. You know, they have a young baby. Actually, I guess she's got a year or two old now, but... You know, they've with the impact schedule, they've been able to control their their life, 
you know, and that means something too. It's not always about money. It's not always about the biggest platform. You know, I have a pretty hectic life. It's, and it's hurt me here on, you know, on my podcast and YouTube, you know, I just don't have the time to do what I want to do. Time is very precious to me. And right now I'm in a position, I, I have a hard time finding time because I have, you know, a full-time job. And then I, thank God I'm not a student anymore, but then I have my Air Force Reserve weekend. And then I have four kids here in the house, you know, so time is precious to me. And I'm still trying to figure out how I can maximize that time. So the impact schedule means something to him. And it means a lot to Alyssa, to, to Melissa. And happy wife, happy life. If she decides, hey, this is just better for us, then Cage is going to stay in impact, you know. Um, but then again, the AEW schedule is not that difficult either. So we'll see. You know, I don't think t- Cage is going to be at the top of the card in AEW. He'll be presented as a big deal, I think, but he wouldn't be at the top of the card. With that being said, and I know this again with 100% certainty, and there, this stuff has come out about this on the internet. So I, you know, I can totally confirm with you that Cage, the reason he lost the RVD like that was it was not a punishment because he's going to AEW or because his contract is up. It has nothing to do with that. He legitimately could not wrestle. So many of you have already seen this on the internet that there was a torn bicep. He wrestled the night before the pay per view, uh, and it was it was ill advised by Impact. I believe they asked him not to do it, but he wrestled a show. And he tore his bicep. So he showed up at Impact the day of the pay per view. And this is secondhand. Effort. This is trust me. I know exactly. This is this is the truth. He should. Not, it's not secondhand. I'm sorry. It's just thirdhand information. But he showed up at Impact uh, at the pay per view and said, "I can't wrestle. I have a torn bicep. I can't do any moves. I can't do anything." So they had to do a last minute rewrite. And from what I understand, Impact wasn't really happy with the way that it came off. They know they could have done better, but they did. They worked with what they had. They worked with the information they had, and that's what they ran with, you know. And it, I'll, I'll get to more of that in the Hard to Kill review in a little bit, but that's what they ran with. So it wasn't a punishment in any way. It was strictly Cage did show up with a torn bicep from the night before and was not able to compete. Now, I'm putting this right now into my own words based off my conversation. This, this is not something like directly from Impact. This is my, my own words. But I'm from the conversation I had. It's been in my own words. I feel that Impact is going to put a, a good offer on the table for Cage, but I think they are prepared to, to lose him. And I don't think if they lose him, I think they're prepared to move on without him because I think they're very concerned about his injury history and he's spent more time injured than not being injured since he's, he's been with impact and it's in, it's affected quite a bit on screen. You know, he couldn't be on TV for a while after he won the title. When he wrestled Elgin at Slammiversary, he almost couldn't even do that match. Because from what I heard, they were prepared for Elgin to do an open challenge. And I think that's the reason. I'm fairly certain that's the reason Tessa and Sammy went on last at the last minute. Because they they weren't totally sure Cage could go. So uh, he obviously did. And he had what I think was match of the year with Elgin. And everything Cage done does and has done is really good. But he's obviously been hurt quite a bit. And now he's hurt again. And it's... It is affecting the t- the program, you know, the television program. The pay per views are having to do rewrites. So, if I'm putting this into my own words, I think um, I think they're prepared to move on without him. So my gut tells me he probably will go to AEW. But I, I hope he doesn't, though. I would like to see him stick around, and I think Impact would like to keep him around. But I just think the offer they're going to make him is probably not as competitive as what like ring of honor is willing to offer, you know, cause they kind of need the star power right now. So we'll see. Um, but he, he definitely is hurt and he is not part of AEW right now. 
He's not flat out. He's he, he's not. He has not signed with them. This isn't just a cover up from Melissa. Let's get into hard to kill though. Uh, let's run through this pay per view. I thought I, I I will say that this pay per view was better than I probably gave it credit for that. I, it was better than what I expected, but it wasn't that. If you were watching Impact for the first time, if you're like, because whenever there's a pay per view, there's always someone who's like, I'm gonna watch. I'm going to give impact a chance. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to order this pay-per-view, see what it's like. If you were that person, I don't think this swayed your opinion on impact either way. I think it, you know, it's kind of like when I ordered the MLW pay-per-view, I said, I'm going to give MLW a shot. And I've, I was bored to tears watching this pay-per-view. I, I paid for it and I didn't even finish watching it. I was, I was falling asleep. I'm not, and it's not me trying to like be funny or nothing like that. I was bored to absolute tears. This, it just didn't connect with me as a wrestling fan. And many, many of you do like MLW, but we just all like different things, right? I didn't connect with it at all. I didn't enjoy it even a little bit. So I've tried to watch a few episodes on YouTube. I've never liked it. I'm like, okay, what are they going to deliver for the pay-per-view? I just didn't like it. It's not for me. Many of you like it. That's cool. I don't. But I think that this pay-per-view, I don't think it did much to someone say, okay, I need to tune in and watch Impact. And it wasn't, everyone worked hard. I just don't think it was that great a card, to be honest. Like, you can't have Rhino RVD and Ken Shamrock take up three matches. I think Rhino did really well. I think he looked really good. And I think everyone did. But you can't, if you're trying to push the new impact and the new era and the new up and coming talent, you can't use three guys like that to to do, you know, you know what I'm saying? The difference at Bound for Glory was that Rhino and RVT, RVD teamed up. And then also you had the Collier Shot Gauntlet where everyone was able to get in on it. But in a, on a card like this, I don't think that works. So I, I think, I think the card did hold it back. A little bit, but let's get into the matches. Um, I'm not going in any. I'm not going in order of the matches. I'm going in order of uh, when. If you saw my review or my preview, I should say on YouTube, you know, I I, uh, I ran through the matches and I just put them in a random order. So I'm going to do the same with this one. It's it's whatever order is right in front of me here. It's not an order of the pay per view. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Michael Elgin and Eddie Edwards. <sighs> Boy, did this deliver. I stand by what, I'm, what I've am what i said. This will be the impact match of the year. Now, the fans are... I should say the fans. The fans will probably get swayed a little bit. But at the end of the year, most likely Tessa versus Sammy will be voted match of the year. But this, this is the match of the year. Elgin versus Ed, Eddie Edwards. I don't know how anything can top this the rest of the year. This is my own personal opinion. This had everything. I was super upset and disappointed when they had a match on impact the week before the pay-per-view. But they, they, even though that match got high marks, I didn't really like it. But I also think the New York crowd is just doesn't give enough. And the match was slow, too. It was kind of more of a strong style, and it just started off so slow. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, this one, the minute the bell rang, they went at it. So it was clear that they were going for two different dynamics with these matches, but... I mean, this was as good a match as you've seen on Impact television or pay-per-view in a really long time. Everything that Elgin has done has been good. And Eddie, I always say, has really hit or miss pay-per-view matches. And it's more because of his opponents, you know, Tommy Dreamer. Or when he had a moose at Bound for Glory and then they made a last-minute tag team match with Cross. And, of course, Tommy Dreamer. And you're throwing these guys in there. I, I think that he had a good match at Homecoming with Moose. You know, it's real hit or miss what we get from Eddie, and it's not due to him. It's just kind of due to what his opponents are. But he keeps the call your shot trophy. I did expect him to win this match. I only got one match wrong in my predictions, but this match was phenomenal, and I'll watch it any day of the week as long as they go at it like that. Like if it's like the episode, the one on Impact, I can do without that. Tag team championship match was the North versus Swan and Willie Mack. You know, uh, obviously, Rich Swan got hurt. He got hurt at the 
bash the brewery. So couldn't compete. So I think many of us thought, okay, they're going to bring in a surprise tag team partner or give them someone. I thought Daga, Daga was going to fill in because I felt like they, you know, Daga was just doing the social media or the media tour, I should say, with Tessa a few days prior. So I'm kind of like, well, they're going to try to get Tessa on, uh, Daga on this card, I think. And they did, obviously. But I thought he was going to be Willie Mack's partner here just for the sake of randomness, just so that he didn't go at it by himself. Damn, this match for me was really good. It uh, it still lived up to my expectations, oddly enough. But just because the story behind it, Willie Mack was voted. I think someone had said this on Twitter. They think Willie Mack went by himself because he was voted the one to watch. And if he wasn't, then maybe they would have found him a partner. But they have to do their best to make that happen creatively. And... Rich Swan obviously, when he went through that gauntlet match, took the next step. And he'd been putting on good matches for a while. He obviously took that next step, though. But I was always concerned about Willie because Willie never really had any many storylines around him. He's just kind of been tagging along with Rich Swan. He's only had one pay-per-view one-on-one match. That was against Sammy Callahan, and I didn't really think that was a good story at all. It just seemed like a random match they threw together at Homecoming. But Willie Mack with this took the next step also. So when Swan is cleared again, these two together, they're going to be a big deal in the tag team division. They're going to be a big force because we have to replace LAX and Lucha Brothers, obviously. Rich Swan and Willie Mack are going to be able to step into those shoes now because creatively they've both had the opportunity to, you know, through different matches, of course, and different scenarios to build up their value so much and really show what they can do. And now the company's going to get behind them hopefully, and we're going to get that big tag team push. So we're we're eventually going to get this match because they teased it at Bound for Glory. I say they teased it because they added RVD and Rhino to it. And then we were supposed to get it this pay-per-view, and we didn't get it. So that's two straight pay-per-views we didn't get this match. That means we're probably going to get it in the future, and it's going to be a really, really big deal, and it's probably going to be an even better match than what these last couple were. So Elgin and Eddie, I I predicted a, you know, I gave it a rating of a three. My my rating system is from one to three. One is not good. Two is okay to good. And three is good to great. So Elgin and Eddie, I said it would be a three. It's a three. Um, North versus Swan and Mac, I said it was going to be a three. I still going to give it a three because even though they were throwing that curveball, I thought it told a good story. And I thought the match was laid out really well ace and trey that one um i'm giving that i I gave that one a three and i'm giving it a three this time too i've read a few reviews where they're saying oh they could have done more i personally thought they delivered a really good x division title match and i look at this one different because trey is a tag team you know i know he does a lot of single stuff for the rascal but at the end of the day he's a tag team wrestler and it's very rare you know, you can take the Kofi and New Day thing, for instance, but it's it's very rare that someone from a tag team or a three man gets that kind of like really strong singles push and that legitimate title shot. You know, that just doesn't happen. And Impact did a really good job with making Trey look like a legitimate contender for this match. And I never thought he was in, in danger of, of win. Uh, I never thought. Ace was in danger of losing. I should say that much. I didn't see him putting the title on Trey, but the fact that they were just willing to say, okay, we're going to take this dude from a tag team and we're going to, we're going to make him seem like a legitimate contender. I just thought it was all delivered well. And then, you know, Trey's usually kind of a, the rascal is kind of a comedy act a little bit. And like he came out serious and he wasn't doing his bullshit. Like they, they talk about when they talk about, Oh, well, Kofi won the title, but he still came out skipping and clapping and throwing pancakes and doing all that. Like they didn't, they didn't do that with Trey. Like they took him away from that gimmick, and they said we're, we're going to bring him serious because we're going to make him serious because Ace brought his mom into this, and it's not going to be like a joke when he comes out. So the presentation of the match was good, and then the way that it ended, where it's like, well, this isn't over because Ace went to the mom, and then uh, Trey lost his shit on him, and the finish of the match, the way he hit the fold and everything, you know, like oh, great X division title match. I was all for it. Cage versus RVD. Um, I said this would be a two. I'm giving this one a one because of just the way it played out. 
on TV, obviously. RVD is getting a really random push here. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a title shot here soon because you're not going to bring RVD into the promotion and him not wrestle for the title at some point. I said that when he when they signed him. So I wouldn't be surprised if he actually has some kind of angle with Tessa going forward. But based off Bash at a Brewery too, I think he's going to have more of an angle with Eddie going forward because they kind of teased um, Alicia and Katie Forbes having beef and all that. So I can see a program there going on, but I give it a one. Um, Cage obviously couldn't go. I thought creatively it was good how he tried to give a high five in the stands and then Katie Forbes' girlfriend had held onto his hand. So I thought what they did was good for what it was, but it wasn't a match. You know, so how can you really give it give it much of a rating? And this is the bananas thing about all this. When they were promoting this match, they were marketing it as a dream match. It's not it was not a dream match. It was never a dream match. A dream match is, you know, uh someone in one company facing someone in another company in a match you never think is gonna happen you know it, it a dream match is almost impossible to actually play out and impact through i say i say this a lot but impact throws that term around so loosely it means absolutely nothing and uh this is this was not a dream match this was just a good you know was going to be a good match i thought it was going to be a good one but it wasn't and um rvd you know, obviously Cage couldn't go, so that's how they played it out on television. And the RVD faces Dog after this, so I think a lot of us watching were like, "Okay, well, maybe Dog is going to come out here and get this upset because I think Dog is going to have a big 2020." And I predicted they would add him to the pay per view somehow, but we're thinking, "Okay, he's going to come out and get this upset." And I wouldn't call it a squash match, but RVD won this pretty easily. I mean. um, even the way when he hit the five star frog splash, I mean, there was, there was enough time. If we're talking about wrestling psychology, that Daga probably could have moved or, you know, he rolled out of the way, but they, it came off like a squash match, and it was super random. Obviously, Daga like was walking past during the interview, and um, you know, you know the way they they brought him into it. I thought it was, you know. Again, this was all last minute stuff, so I can't fault him too much, but just the whole thing from top to bottom uh, gets a strong one. Fulton versus Shamrock. I had given this uh, a one in my preview. I'm actually going to give it a two because it over delivered, in my opinion. Uh, it was a little clunky, and I'm sure a lot of people didn't really like it. And it was a really weird placement to put it first. You know, that's usually where you put the what gets the crowd going, but. My opinion was that this was the crowd, the match that the crowd was most likely going to be dead through. So why not march him out there when the crowd's at its hottest? You know, uh, they're always at their hottest at the beginning of the, the night. So that, I think, you know, played a role into the, making this more enjoyable than it probably should have been. And I thought Fulton looked pretty good. Shamrock actually looked pretty good, too. And I've, you know, I've said that he hasn't looked good, in my opinion, in any, really in any of these matches. But, you know, I gave it a one. Uh, I, I really give it a two now. I thought it was a, a big step up from what I thought it was going to be. So here, let me tell you about this, about the impact. The uh, I don't know why I just said impact. What, about the end of the match. And again, some of you have probably read this stuff online, and I'm telling you 100% certainty. They did not change the finish of this match. Obviously, RVD versus Cage, they changed the finish of that. I think RVD was still penciled to win, though. That's why he beat Daga. But Fulton versus Shamrock, they did not change the finish of the match. Shamrock was supposed to win. This was the only prediction I got wrong, and I knew when they came out first that I was going to get it wrong because Impact does not have heels go over in the in the opening match. I think it happened once with Ace Austin at a Rebellion or something like that. I don't remember what pay per view it was. You know, it was a six man scramble, X Division scramble. Like he won, but it's it's very rare that a company has a heel win the opening match. You know, it's usually that feel good. All right, everybody. Yay. Here's the match. That means nothing. Let's get the baby face over. So when they came out, I knew Shamrock was going to win. Um, but they didn't change the finish. What happens is, uh, Fulton, when the arm popped out of its socket, I guess it does that quite often with him. You know, that's just something that the way his body makeup is, 
when he's wrestling, his his arm actually pops out of socket quite a bit. So what happened was they they didn't change the finish on the fly, but they just changed you know they changed the delivery of it on the fly. I thought they were able to. I thought Fulton actually looked strong in defeat because of this, but and I thought it added to the finish of the match too. You know, it, it made sense. Res, wrestling psychology, we talk about. You know, it, it just made sense. But he's not actually injured. He's not gonna like. From what I'm understand, I don't think he's gonna like miss time or anything like that. They might, you know, might not put him in the ring right away. But this this was something they're not overly concerned of. It popped out of socket. It happens with them all the time. It's happened before. And they they just ran with you know they they sent the match home at that point but they just they tweaked it a little but that was the finish Shamrock was always supposed to go over Moose versus Rhino I had given this one a one and main reason I gave it a one initially was because of the build up to the match I thought was really silly I thought it was really forced I thought it was uh, the heat was really manufactured I don't think there was real heat there you know what I mean they they kind of made it look like there was or there should have been. So I thought I thought the build was kind of silly, and then I actually didn't think the match was going to be that good because, you know, Rhino's last match with RVD, which was the, you know, where Tommy Dreamer was the ref. Like I didn't like that match at all. I thought it was super slow, and and I was I was I was really bored watching it. So I I questioned can Rhino put on a good match at this stage in his career, and this became a no DQ. I don't think that was announced beforehand. Another random impact throwing something at you but I thought the new no DQ really worked for this because we don't see Moose in those kind of matches normally we see Rhino RVD whatever all the time Dreamer do those kind of matches but this was a little out of Moose's element Moose comes down with the Macho Man gear and he's doing the Macho Man stuff during the match and the elbow you know like it was so entertaining but I thought Rhino played his what his role really really well I love that Moose hit the no jackhammer needed early. You know, I really, I really liked that. So I, I thought, I thought they over delivered quite a bit and I was entertained way more than I thought it was going to be, but I did unfairly give them a one just due to how poor I thought that build was for it. It wasn't even a build. It was just a random match. They threw together and try to convince us to care with spear versus gore. But, uh, overall it was good. Uh, the right person won and Moose looked really strong in defeat. I mean, and, and uh, Moose didn't look strong in defeat. He looked strong in his match and winning the match. And I really think his push needs to happen uh, to get him in the world title scene sooner than later. Cause he really deserves it. He's knocking everything out of the park, but I would think they're probably not going to put him into that until the middle end of the year, because when they have the TNA show, at WrestleMania, I know he's challenged. I think Monty Brown, but I, I have a feeling he's just going to have a good angle for that. So I think later in the year they're going to find a way to get him in there. But uh, the match definitely overdelivered. The knockouts match, which was Taya against Jordan and o- OBD, ODB. I'm sorry, OBD, ODB. Uh, thought Taya would win, and she did. And I don't know when Ty is going to drop this belt, but it would be, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to think she's going to drop it on a taped episode of Impact at this point. So I'm really curious to see who her next pay per view opponent is. I would assume it's going to be Jordan Grace one on one. I think we're finally going to get that, and then I think Jordan's going to win at that pay per view, which I think is going to be Rebellion. So I, I, I think Jordan's going to win then. And at that point, I think Ty is going to be done with the company. And uh, I think Kelly Klein is a lock to end up as a knockout because she's clearly not going to go to AEW now, and they really need her. But she would be a wonderful replacement for Tessa and the you know for Tessa not being a knockout quote unquote anymore, and for Taya, you know that's the perfect person to bring in. But that being said, um, I think I think Jordan's going to win at the next pay per view, and then I think Taya is going to be gone out of the company. Uh, it's just a personal opinion because at this point there's not much she can do. So unless she's just really happy with impact, she has no real reason to, to stick around in, in my opinion. I hope he, I hope she does. Cause she's, if you're talking about Taya from day one to now, I mean, what a, what an impressive change now this, but this knockouts match, I gave it a two and I still give it a two. I was um, entertained during this one and I thought a lot of what they did was a little bit safe. It was a little bit cookie cutter when you're talking about a triple threat match. 
and I, as I said on my preview, triple threat matches are better when it's two heels and a baby face. Like two baby faces and a heel is a little more difficult to lay out. But I really thought um, Taya was going to win because she lost too many non-title matches up to this. And I said, they're not going to take their longest reigning knockouts champion and have her drop the title after dropping four non-title matches up to the pay-per-view. I mean, that's just not going to happen. That's just freaking common sense. So when that had happened, uh, you know, she lost J- ODB. ODB had pinned her twice. Jordan had pinned her twice. I was like, she's going to win, plain and simple. I really think they were trying to build to Rosemary eventually taking the title off her because we want another Rosemary title reign, obviously. And they have that weird dynamic with Taya and, Te- Taya and uh, Rosemary on TV. But I'm starting to think maybe they just don't feel that right now Rosemary's in the in the ring in ring shape to carry the division like that. You know, because she doesn't wrestle that much. So I think she's still trying to get uh, get back healthy again and everything, and get into the shape that she wants to be in. So I I think they kind of distance themselves from that and. I think they really teased with the way this... I thought the finish was done good. I mean, it was a classic heel finish, triple threat finish. I mean, there, there wasn't anything too creative about it. Um, but I thought it was delivered well. And I thought I thought there was good moments in this match. I think ODB held it back a little bit. You know, I don't think it was a necessary inclusion. But they did that with everything going on with the food truck and then... Um, you know, obviously NWA brought her on too, and it's good to see her, you know, get some extra work and, and all that. I mean, impacts, I obviously did this to support her and help take care of her and help her, her mission and everything. And I think they thought it would make the knockouts match a bigger deal, adding her to it after what happened. So, you know, it was cool. I would have kind of preferred the one-on-one, but I think I probably enjoy this match most more than most people did. But I, I thought it—I thought it came off pretty good. It was basically ex- what I expected it to be, and I'm glad Taya won. Taya shouldn't drop the title in a, in a triple threat uh, match, longest reigning knockout champion. Like there should be a one-on-one heated feud, and I think that will happen with Jordan Grace after this. So main event: Sammy Tessa. I gave that a three in my preview, and I still give it a three. This match was laid out really well. There was two excellent matches on this pay-per-view. Sammy versus Tessa and Elgin versus Eddie. And then uh, there were some really good matches. You know, just solid matches. But there was two, you know, to use Impact's term, two must-see matches on this. And uh, after, you know, I've been really critical of the Tessa-Sammy build, obviously. I, I complain about it on all my social media platforms and on my podcast and whatever I'm doing. I've always complained of, you know, Tessa's superwoman. She keeps running through. She beats OVE every single week. You know, not that I want 50-50 booking by any stretch, but, I mean, God, they just don't want her to lose. You know, and, and you see a lot of wrestling fans turn against wrestlers when they can't lose, you know. It just, it just kind of gets old after a while. That's what happened with John Cena. Like, he just he just always won. It didn't matter what odds you threw at him. And that's why I, start, I started getting upset with this because I said, you know, OVE has been together for how long? And Tessa can grab, you know, Tommy Dreamer, uh, the guy who sells popcorn, and me. And we'll go out there and, and win the match. You know, like that's just like bananas to me. That I, I don't get that, but I just don't think they. I think they really didn't want to lose Tessa, and I don't think they're going to lose her now. You know, at the end of the match when she said, "I'm the standard bearer right now," like I took that as impact as my home, and I'm going to put it on my back. You know, that's how I, I took that whole thing. But this match was really good. I mean, their Slammiversary match was really good. I thought Unbreakable was okay. I thought it was really slow and and you know, a little too slow for my taste, but man, they went at the, the, the way that when the bell rang, they did this a few years ago, bound for glory, but while they were in, uh, JB was introducing JB, like Lashley went and speared him out of the ring. Um, and that match right there, maybe I'll talk about that later, but that was the biggest turning point in EC3's impact career. In my opinion, I think I'm going to do a YouTube upload on that later, but, um, I liked when, when uh, Sammy attacked Tessa right away. I mean, they show that there was really genuine heat. You know, they didn't start off with a collar elbow tie up, you know, it was genuine heat. And then I love that he hit the cactus special early and went for the win early. 
I loved how that played out. I didn't think they overdid it with like kicking out of super finishers and, and the near falls and, you know, because that, that becomes very tiring. You know, when you watch uh, AEW, like it just, and the way our uh, Ring of Honor used to be, just all these near falls and super finishers, like, oh my God, stop, you know? But I thought they paced this out really well. There weren't too many pin attempts and near falls and all that. They They got away from the formula that they were using before. I mean, this was a, delivered as a completely different match. The drama was amazing and Tessa pulled it out. And as I said, I was really critical about all this up to this point, but was really happy with how to, how it played out because with the drama that kind of made me gravitate closer to Tessa and be more of a supporter of her. Um, you know, it worked in that f- in her favor, in that opinion, I think a lot of fans grew towards her, and the and the crowd was really behind her. And th- you know, this is this is going to be interesting stuff. I mean, Impact obviously at this point at this juncture has to work outside the box. That's just what it comes down to. So people are going to say, "Oh, I don't, a woman's a champion," and da da da. You know, Don Cal's always says, it's, "You know, she's one of the best wrestlers in the world." Notice I didn't say women's wrestlers. Like, she's one of the best women wrestlers in the world okay that this this is my opinion on this whole thing is that yeah when you're talking about wrestlers you know if i'm talking to a fan like oh he's a wrestler she's a wrestler so in that term yeah he's a wrestler but or or, she's a wrestler but i don't like this whole oh she's one of the best you know because you're insinuating that she's better than a lot of the guys which she is better than a certain amount of the guys but women are also judged much differently than men are in the ring so i mean is she, yes, she's a bigger star, but is she a better athlete than Desmond Xavier or Ace Austin or something like that? I mean, you know what I mean? Like those two are capable of putting on better matches than her just because women are on a different scale and women and men wrestle totally different. You know, that doesn't mean Tessa's not better than a lot of guys because she is, but, you know, I, I just... I still call her one of the best women wrestlers in the world. I don't, I don't do that whole Don Callis thing that he does, but I'm really curious because I think at lockdown, we're just going to get another match between these two. And it, now we're getting like, okay, enough. You know, she's feuded with LVE. I've mentioned this in the past, but after she lost at Slammiversary, she wrestled a member of OVE in every single match from Slammiversary to hard to kill. There's not a week that you can find that she wrestled someone in six months, eight months, whatever it is, that wasn't a member of OBE. And it's really played out at this point. I mean, I mean, let me say it's not played out. I just mean, if they continue to go with it, then it's going to be like, oh my God, enough. You know? So I think Sammy's probably going to get his rematch. I think it's going to happen in a cage, which, you know, it tells a good story because that's where he won it. And maybe he'll win it back. I don't know, because it's hard to imagine what kind of program she's going to have with other people. Is she going to wrestle Michael Elgin? You know, it's believable to say she can beat Sammy Callahan because they're not, he's not a big, he's not a heavyweight. It depends on your term of heavyweight, but he's not that big muscular dude, you know? But then again, she beat Brian Cage, so I don't know. But is she going to beat Moose? Is she going to beat Michael Elgin? It's it's hard to imagine, so I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't kind of a shorter title reign for Tessa, and it wouldn't surprise me if Sammy wins it and Impact goes right back to the well and has the, the two of them feud for 2020. It, it would not surprise me, but I'm okay with Tessa being the champion. I've never been uh, against her winning. I've never been against the intergender wrestling. I've just been against them making her look like Superwoman. And then every time she wrestles, Don Callis is like, she's a woman. Stop the match. Like, what is it, dude? Is she an equal or is she a woman? You know? But um, it's hard to imagine what they're going to do with her going forward as the champion. But there's intrigue. You know, they may have to do like NWA does and kind of bring some people from outside the company for some, you know, a few angles and stuff like that. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, people have been joking that she's going to get a ch- title versus title match with Taya. <laughs> Could you imagine if she's the one? Oh my God, that just that just hit me. She's gonna. What, what if she's the one to take the title off uh, Taya? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, we'll see. Maybe she loses a Sammy. I, I was thinking she's going to unify that. Not unify, but maybe she's going to hold two belts. Or maybe she loses a Sammy, returns to the knockouts division, and holds that. Who knows? Who knows? But it's going to be interesting 2020 for Impact Wrestling. This was a longer podcast than normal for me. So uh, thanks for riding with me. And I'm probably going to drop another one this week. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to review this past episode of Impact because there's really nothing to review. But uh, hope to be podcasting soon. And thanks for listening once again. This is BQ. I am your boy. And I'm out.